Hey, hey, how's everybody doing? All right, I'm gonna go around pinching everybody who's not wearing green today. Just so you know, I wore my green. All right, Miss Jeanette wore hers. Hey, we're glad to see you guys no matter what you're wearing. We are, we are so glad to have you join us in worship this morning. I'm so glad to see all of you. Isn't it a great day to come into the presence of the Lord, yeah? I'm glad to see these two guys up here. I'm glad to have my kids with me. Y'all say hey to Alex and Hope. Hey, everybody, yeah. And uh, we're so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. So how many of y'all have had a week? Wow, yeah. How many of y'all have had some struggles this week? Oh, I got two hands up over here. Yeah, if you didn't raise your hands, you didn't hear me, or you um, just don't believe that, uh, you know, you know, you don't believe uh, that you really had struggles, but you weren't awake. Well, we have an enemy, and we have battles, and we fight them every day, but we have a victor, and his name is Jesus Christ. And we're fighting these battles, but he's already won them. He's already declared the victory. Amen? Aren't we glad to serve a risen Savior? Would you stand this morning? Would you lift your voices in worship with this wonderful song, The Battle Belongs to You, Jesus. Let's sing out to him. the battle you see my victory when all I see is a mountain you see a mountain move and as I walk through the shadow your love surrounds me For I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle. for you when all I see are the ashes you see the beauty when all I see is a cross God you see the empty
you glad that we can take our problems to Jesus and he meets us right where we are? Amen. While you're seated, would you give a rousing round of applause to just about the best pastor's wife anywhere? Would you say hey to my dear, precious, sweet sister in Christ, Mrs. Tina Bush? She's the president of my fan club. Yes, I am. Well, welcome, welcome, welcome to our Rehoboth Church family. My name is Tina Bush. I am Pastor Troy's wife and the director of your children's ministry and women's ministry. I'm so glad to see all of you here. If this is your first time here or your first time in a very long time, we invite you after the service to join us at the welcome table over there to my left, and um, we would love to meet you and give you a free gift for coming and joining us this morning. If it's your first time online, uh, say hello in the comments so that we can welcome you to our church family. I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who helped with the men's gathering last Sunday night. That was a, from what I hear, because I'm not a man, uh, from what I hear, that was an amazing event, and um, the Holy Spirit worked, the gospel went out, and uh, we are seeing fruit from that event. So I am very grateful to all of you who helped with that. Um, how many of you would say that you always are perfect at loving your neighbor all the time? I would say that you're not, but you know what? We have opportunity for you to do this and practice so next Saturday, March 23rd, is our annual extravaganza in the gym. And if you would like to come and have fun, eat a few pieces of candy here and there, and play some games with a lot of people, enjoy a petting zoo, um, jump on an inflatable, or um, have some ice cream, we invite you to come and be a part of that event. Now. If you are able to volunteer, that is even better. You get a gold star from Tina Bush for that. And so if you would like to volunteer, I would invite you to email me at tinabush at rehoboth.org and say, I'm in, I'm ready to come volunteer, and I will give you all the details you need. It is easy, it is fun, and I encourage you to come and practice loving your neighbor as we reach out to our community. And also invite those of you that, invite your neighbors that you know who have kids to come and bring their kids. This is an event for our community and so we wanna reach out with that. Um, and then the next Sunday, the 31st, in two weeks is a big Sunday for us. It's Easter Sunday and we ask you to be ready to come and worship with us, worship our risen Savior, and invite your neighbors to join us for that. Invite family. It is a perfect time to invite people to come and be a part of that service. Um, also, thank you all for giving to our giving, giving your tithes and your offerings. We um, ask that you continue to be faithful with that. You can give online, you can give through the mail, you can give in person with our baskets at the back of the, uh, audit of the sanctuary and the baskets back there. Um, and you can give online. So um, it's, we make it as easy as possible for you to give your tithes and offerings. So now I would invite you to stand and greet one another with uh, a wave, a handshake, a fist bump, whatever's comfortable for you um, as you greet one another.
Hey folks, if you will find your seat. It is so good to see you this morning. If you're a guest with us, just know generally when I step up here and ask people to find their seat, most Sundays it's immediate, today's an exception. Yeah, yeah, in my dreams. So, uh, hey, on your sheet, on your seats, there is a sheet there that talks about our Who's Your 110. I'm going to ask you to grab a hold of that. And if it's not right in your seat, there should be one right close to you. All right, so we've been talking about this a bit. I hope you have taken one of these home and you have filled out the side that has 10 lines and written down the names of 10 folks that you can pray about and ask and invite to be with us on Easter Sunday morning. If you say, hey, pastor, I've got five people, great. If you need more room, you can take an extra one with you or use an extra sheet of paper. Either way, we really want to encourage you to be sure you're doing this. And all of us on an ongoing basis ought to be thinking about somebody who is in our life that we are praying for and that we are earnestly desiring to see become a follower of Jesus Christ. It will change their life for eternity. And I hope that you're taking that seriously. Be sure to stop by after the service and uh, drop the balls in related to your inviting and your praying. Let, let me just, let's just think about this for a minute. Jesus said he came so that we could have Easter egg hunts. To sit, now, now listen, as long as you put those little baby roosts in the Easter eggs, we're good. He said he came to do what? Seek and to save the lost. If you're genuinely a follower of Jesus Christ, it is not possible to go day by day and not to be earnest about seeing others follow Jesus Christ. That is why he came. That is why we are gathered here together. I'm going to invite Tina to come back and she's going to lead us in reading scripture and then we're going to pray together. I will be reading from Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Then drink their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their name on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel in the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the paths of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you'll take your, um, your sheet that's on your, on your seat this morning, and even if you haven't written any names on it yet, go ahead and take a minute to do that. We're going to spend a minute or so praying silently for anyone that you know who um, you could start sharing the gospel with or that you have shared the gospel with and they haven't yet received Christ. So we're gonna take a minute to pray over that.
Heavenly Father, we come before you and we lay these names at your feet. Father, we confess that oftentimes we're quick to talk about the latest restaurant that we love or the latest television show that we love. We're quick to talk about our family, quick to talk about what's growing in our garden. But Father, we confess that we should be quick to talk about our Savior. Lord, we pray that you will give us boldness, that we would take every opportunity to share the love of Jesus with those around us. We pray for those who, um, or who we love and are in our lives that have not yet received Christ as their Savior. We pray that you would convict them, that you would continue to work in their hearts and that the seeds we have planted would grow. Father, as we lead up to Easter, we pray that there would be a great day of rejoicing as we bring others to, to our church family to follow you. Lord, we pray over this service. We pray for our worship team and we pray for Pastor Troy. We pray that all we do, think, say in this service this morning would bring honor and glory to you alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Let's stand and sing and keep those words in mind. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. In the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name.
Jesus, there's just something about that name. Do y'all remember this old song? Sing it out with me to the Lord. Master, Savior, Jesus, like a fragrance after the rain. Jesus, Jesus. the name above every other name. It's the name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. It's the name we will all join together in eternity and kneel before and cry, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. It's the most beautiful name that's ever been uttered. And it is the name that has the power to save. Praise God for the name of Jesus, amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. out to our Lord.
Father, for you are good and greatly to be praised, Lord. We thank you and we cry, holy, holy, holy are you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you for everything that you have done, are doing, and will do. And all of God's people said, amen, amen, and amen. Would you please be seated? January the 11th, 1989, President Ronald Reagan gave a farewell speech to the nation from the Oval Office. It was his final farewell speech. He said, my fellow Americans, this is the 34th time I'll speak to you from the Oval Office and the last. We've been together eight years now and soon it'll be time for me to go. But before I do, I wanted to share some thoughts, some of which I've been saving for a long, long time. President Reagan's speech on that day is certainly well worth your time. And students, let me remind you, if you want to be a person of greatness, a person that genuinely makes a significant difference in this life and in this world, you should give your time to this speech and that to others who have had a great and good impact on humanity. Let me inject some, interject something important, and it's important to understand this. In my view, Ronald Reagan was one of the best presidents that this nation has ever had. He, however, was not perfect. And even in this speech, he reflects the frailty of his humanity. He speaks strongly about America being a great nation, and it is a great nation. And he spoke persuasively about the need to teach our children to love and honor and to protect our country. 
He also spoke about the necessity of restoring a healthy and a vibrant patriotism. And that would often happen most frequently around the dinner table. But President Reagan committed a significant error by not teaching us how to talk about the dark hours and even the sins of our nation. Even in his speech, he said, quote, so we've got to teach history based not on what's in fashion, but what's important. Why the pilgrims came and who Jimmy Doolittle was and what those 30 seconds over Tokyo meant. If we forget what we did, we won't know who we are. I am warning of an eradication of the American memory that could result ultimately in an erosion of the American spirit. Let's start with some basics, more attention to American history, and a greater emphasis on civic ritual. I couldn't agree more with him about his desire there. But it would have been so helpful for Reagan also to have shared among those most monumental moments of why it was important to stand in a bus And refuse to be told you have to sit in the back because of the color of your skin. Or why it was important to sit in a jail having done no violence but simply demanded equal rights. Farewell speeches like this are important. They're incredibly important. Great leaders reveal as much about good leadership in farewell speeches as they do about the topics that they address. And the Bible includes a number of farewell speeches and prayers. You do well to give your attention to them and to consider carefully what they say. In fact, in our journey through the book of Acts, we come to the Apostle Paul's third farewell speech that he gives. I've titled this message, A Farewell to Remember, and it is an important one. It represents exceptional Christian leadership. And it addresses critical topics, topics that are important not only for the church in Ephesus, but also for today's church families. So let's take a quick look at four things that he really emphasizes and focuses in on in this text. They are set an example, persist to the finish line, warn against false teachers and false teachings, and pass the mantle. He, he concludes this farewell address to the elders of the church in Ephesus. He's in Miletus and he has called them to come to him. The elders are the pastors, the leaders of the church. And he's called them to come to, them, to him for him to share with them the very last time that he would have the opportunity to speak to them in person. At the end of this address, he says these words in Acts 20 verses 36 through 38. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful, most of all because the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again, and they accompanied him to the ship. As we lean into this, we, we need to stop and think carefully. And this message today is not simply to the pastors of the Rehoboth Church family, though it speaks clearly to each of us. But this is a message for the entire church family and for every church family. There, there is a growing concern happening in churches across America One aspect of that is a a desire to, in essence, put the walls around the church and that we are the only expression of God's goodness and the rest of the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we should just allow it to go. The other is the danger that we have literally invited all of the ways and the teachings of the world into our midst and it is becoming increasingly difficult to tell the difference between one who is a genuine steward of the gospel and a pastor of a church or the pastors of the church and someone who is simply a community, community communicator. These four examples, these four 
truths, principles that, that just roll out of this text here in Acts chapter 20 are reminders to all of us that speak to the nature of the church family and it speaks carefully and loudly to the role and responsibilities of those who God has called to be pastors and elders and overseers of the church. Let's jump in and look at the first of these. And we find it in Acts 20, verses 18 through 21. Let's look at these. And when he came to them, and, and excuse me, and when they came to him, he said to them, you yourselves know how I have lived among you the whole time from the first day that I set foot in Asia, serving the Lord with all humanity and with tears, with trials that happened to me through the plots of the Jews, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. This, this text, these few verses here from 18 to 21, really focus in and speak to the necessity that pastors ought to be examples and models in a church family. This is gonna be an easy yes or no question. Are pastors perfect? <laughs> Y'all got it right. I am impressed. Maybe we have been on display. <laughs> Are pastors sinless? No. Is our preaching and teaching the inspired divine word of God? No. In fact, church families should be like the Bereans and they should test everything, everything against the word of God. But we have moved to a place where we give excuses and justifications for those who call themselves pastors and teachers of God's word to do things, to say things, and to be people that Jesus would never recognize among his followers. It has become okay for some pastors to talk about the lavish lifestyles they live and how God has blessed them to be wealthy and to be rich because God would never want his people to be impoverished. You and I need to understand that God cares deeply for his people, those with means and those without. And we need to understand that it is not the means themselves that are particularly sinful, but it is the love of money that is the root of evil. Paul talks about the fact that he lived among them, an old phrase by old pastors from decades ago that somehow seems to have lost favor today is that sheep stink. Yeah, Y'all didn't think that was so funny, did you? And that pastors should so walk with stinky sheep that they smell like the sheep. Throughout the week, our ministries as the pastors of this church involve all kinds of administrative tasks and all types of roles and meetings and activities and community engagement and a whole host of things. But among the most important of things that we as pastors do is spend time with the body of Christ. And certainly we're doing that here. Certainly we do that now as we would gather together corporately in worship. But it goes far beyond that in us living our lives with one another. A number of years ago, I was talking with a staff member of a church that was quite large. And he had been on staff a number of years. And and we were, were really just kind of comparing notes a bit. And, and uh, he, he began asking how often do the pastors ever eat together? And as we discussed that, I, I asked him, I said, how often do the, the pastors of your church ever get together? He said, never. And I said, you're, you're telling me that the pastors of your church never eat together, never meet together. He said, I've been, this is what he said. He said, I've been on staff of this church 25 years. I came right after the, the senior pastor came. I've never even been in his 
home. Brothers and sisters, that is just not a biblical example in that the pastors are not to be people who are set up on podiums and set on platforms. We are to walk among the body of Christ and to be with the body. Can we be in each of your homes every day? Of course not. You're off the hook. You don't want us to be. Thank you, Denise. Oh. One of your disciples, I am sure. (laughs) But you, you should know that your pastors of this church work hard to not simply know the names of those that are immediately around, but they work hard to know your names. And is it possible to know every one of your names and get it right every time? No. But we work hard at it. We are intentional about it. Even though each of our pastors has defined responsibilities, we are all pastors of this entire congregation and church family. And so we are involved in ministries across the church family. That should be the norm and there should never be excuses otherwise. That is normative church family life, not exceptional, not unusual. You don't find a bunch of reserved parking spaces for the staff and pastors of this church. Now, true enough, on this side of the building, there are two reserved spots. I park in one of those. One of the main reasons for that is I am in and out of here during the week at all times, and I need to be able to get to my vehicle. But before the service, most weeks, not all, most weeks, I come in early and I walk and I talk with, this is my family. I mean, you are my family. I am not simply a paid Bible teacher. I probably shouldn't tell you this. You pay me for what I do Monday through Saturday. I preach for free. (laughs) If you want my preaching to be better, let's work on this. I preach because I am called of God to proclaim the good news and the teachings of God's Christ, not because of a paycheck. And any day that my preaching is constrained or contained solely because of whether I'm being paid or not, I am no longer qualified for ministry. And no pastor is. I I am baffled at times by pastors who retire who say that, you know, they've had wonderful ministries and they're excited and then their social media feeds are only filled with their travel and and the the nice places they're going and their, their, their restaurants they're attending to and all of the grandchildren's events that they're going to. Dear Lord, their time ought to be filled also in the nursing homes and in the nurseries. And in the homes of their church family, whether they're the lead pastor or not, for that calling ought to be a lifelong calling unless they have disqualified themselves. It's important that the pastors and elders and overseers, all three words meaning one role, one position in God's church, they should be people who are setting examples. One place I've failed miserably is I've tried to set an example as a Florida State fan and y'all have not followed me. My family and I, from day one, have been engaged faithfully in our church. Why? Because we think that's normative of what it means to be part of church family. My wife and I give above 10% and give to special offerings and other things. Why? Because the chairman of our deacons comes and asks me annually, do you? No. Because that is who we should be. That, that is who we ought to be. Is ministry difficult and challenging? Every day. Every day. But let me ask you, if you are the parent of a two-year-old, is life difficult and challenging? Every day. Every day, 
In this broken world, life is going to be difficult and being pastors and leaders in churches is difficult. And yet we ought to be the ones above all setting that example, being present, being engaged, loving. When we offend, we ought to ask for forgiveness when it is sinful and in error. And I am grateful to serve among men who are your pastors who are just like you, none of us like to say, man, I was wrong, I am sorry. I mean, anybody who says they really enjoy doing, now afterwards you, you generally feel much better, but anybody who says they enjoy doing that, no. The, those words, I was wrong, are really hard to get to come out of the mouth. But I am honored to serve with men who walk faithfully and righteously as your pastors, who seek to walk in righteousness. And when they do err and even sin, they are also faithful to own it, to ask for forgiveness, to say, I'm sorry. None of us can write checks. None of us have access to any of the church's bank accounts, not any of us. That's a good thing. That is a right thing. Our leadership team has full access to full, complete financial reports every month. That is a good and right thing. That is an example that we desire to set. And if you notice, and I think you do, as we are teaching, even now we're coming through the book of Acts, we, we have come through some passages that would have just been easier just to skip over them and to move on. Some of these, I mean, like this one, this is to us primarily, like, well, let's just skip on and let's talk about the responsibilities and the characteristics of sheep, not shepherds. But we have sought to be faithful to do, even as the Apostle Paul says in verse 20, how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you in public and from house to house. That requires us, and we have taken that, that just rock solid stand and now almost 13 years that I've been your lead pastor, we have never endorsed any political candidate for any office. Because our role as prophet pastor teachers is to be a prophetic voice, even with our friends who are in public service at times. And we should never abdicate that. This place is not for sale. For favor or finances. But we have also not been timid about speaking into matters that sometimes have political elements about them. At times are quite uncomfortable. We've been willing to talk about that this is a great nation and my soul it is. But it is a nation that has deep scars and very dark wounds, some of them awfully and self-inflicted. And we can be honest and transparent about both of those simultaneously. I think that's one of the problems that has gotten us into some of the mess that we're in is that we have not been willing to talk about both of those simultaneously. Because that is the America of who we are, is it not? And some of us, I grew up on the Gulf Coast of Florida. Those of you who grew up in the Atlanta area, we still grieve for you that you think fresh frozen fish is fresh fish. <laughs> if it was not swimming in the last 24 hours, it ain't fresh. We had customs along the coast in Northwest Florida that are very different than here. And I'm just gonna tell you one, it's beginning to change a little bit here, but it's still predominantly here. You go to virtually any funeral in the Atlanta Metro and most of the people are in darker clothes. You almost never will see the pastor or whoever is leading that service in a, a, a tan colored jacket or a light colored jacket or a light, I mean, they're, 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 they're almost always gonna be in a suit and tie and they're almost always dark, not in Florida. It's not uncommon. Now, and if you're in South Florida, they won't even have a tie on most of the time. Because one, it'd be soaking wet by the time they were done. But it's not uncommon at all for the pastors to have lighter colored suits on. And it's really not uncommon for most of the people have attended seldom often 
unless it's a really formal funeral, is mo- are most of the people in dark colors. And that, that's a simple illustration, but, but things are different in different parts of the country, and uh, those are fun things to talk about. Those are fun differences. But pastors should be ones who are willing to set the example to lean in and ultimately to do exactly as the Apostle Paul said, teaching in public and from house to house, testifying both the Jews and Greeks, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Sojourner Truth is somebody, if you don't know her, you should know her. She was born Isabella Bomfrey. She was born in the late 1700s into slavery in the state of New York. In 1826, she escaped with her infant child. She had five children. She escaped with her infant child. A family for $20, she she escaped and was actually taken in by a family. They bought her freedom for $20. And she became an extraordinary leader. She did something that was the first to have ever been done in that she sued a white man who had illegally sold her five-year-old son into slavery in Alabama and she won the case and got her five-year-old son back. She never learned to read or write, yet she spoke all over, especially the Northeast and then the, the Midwest. She was an extraordinary voice against slavery and then in particular for women's suffrage. And if you have not studied history well or have a fresh reminder, there was a time in this country that if you didn't own property, you didn't vote. And there was a time that if you were a woman, you didn't vote. And she not only was a contemporary of Frederick Douglass and Susan B. Anthony, but she fought not only for the causes of freedom for black people, but she fought for the rights of women. People would line up to hear her speak. She literally was able to sustain her life through the sales of a book, her biography that she simply narrated and another wrote down and published for her. She is an incredible individual and one well worth you and I knowing. Say, well, those sound good, but really how significant it was. She was so significant that in 1864, Abraham Lincoln invited her to come to the White House and meet him. An extraordinary leader, an incredible example To our pastors of this church, it is important that you and I hold each other accountable to be not perfect and sinless, but righteous examples in this church family and before this church family. For this church family, it must be remembered that all of your pastors are ultimately interims, right? This year, the first Sunday in August, we will celebrate our 170th anniversary. And if the Lord tarries, I can say confidently, I am not your first pastor and I will not be your last senior pastor. All of us have seasons in which we stand in the place where we are pastors of this wonderful, amazing church family. Rehoboth Church family always expect that your pastors be examples among you according to the word of God. A second thing that the apostle Paul leans into here is is he talks about persisting to the finish line. That's the, the second main theme here. I mentioned it a bit earlier. Persist to the finish line. Look with me in what Acts 20 verses 22 to 27 say in God's word. And now behold, I am going to Jerusalem constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me in every city that imprisonment and affliction await me. But I do not count my life of any value nor as precious to myself. If I only, uh, if only I may finish my course in the ministry that I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now behold, 
I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom will see my face again. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God's word. This idea of persisting and sustaining and not quitting and not giving up is something that is being lost across our culture. And it's not just being lost on the next generation. It is amazing how rapidly almost every generation that is alive today is being infected by this spirit of quit. Anything worth doing is worth persevering for. Maybe said this way, everything worth doing is worth persevering for. It matters not how old you are, you are still a parent if God has given you children. On your deathbed, you are still a parent speaking into the lives of your children and he he has blessed further your grandchildren and maybe even great-grandchildren. You never stop being a parent. You never stop desiring that your children walk in paths of righteousness and you never stop encouraging them and instructing them in that direction for Satan seeks to kill and steal and destroy the family above all institutions in this world doing ministry these days is hard even just this past week a new study has come out that that here not long ago it it, that study said that the average attendance in a local church on a given Sunday morning across America is 50 people that was previously Today, the average attendance, and, and see, we watch on television, we see these big mega churches with, with seating, with thousands sitting in them. Uh huh. But even putting them into the mix, the average across North America today, sitting in this hour, in the hour before, in the hour after, 38 people total. 38 people total. More and more of our neighbors are saying, hey, I may be kind of okay with Jesus, but I'm not okay with those folks who gather on Sundays or Saturday nights or Wednesday nights or Tuesday. Some of you have encountered some hard things in a church family. Maybe this one, maybe another one. And quite honestly, I really do look at that like in some ways going to a doctor, you've trusted that doctor, you, you're looking for them to do good. Have every, any of you ever changed a doctor because you didn't think they were doing good? Because maybe they actually did bad? Did you throw your arms up and say, well, I'm never going to a doctor again? N- not if you have any wisdom about you at all. Any of you who are in a household with any other people, Have you ever gone a week without stepping on each other's toes? Have you ever offended one another to where that house, no matter how big it is, or that apartment or that condo, how big it is, it feels too small because you want to be at one end and you want the others to be at the other end? Have you experienced, don't look at me like that. Tina and I never have, I don't know about y'all. What are you laughing for? (laughs) We have. Do you think that the Lord would put you in a church family? Do you think it's even possible that he would put you in a church family where you would encounter difficulties, even relational difficulties, in which he intended to do something in your life that he would not do in any other setting? where he teaches you to be able to say, I forgive you? Or where he teaches you to say, will you forgive me? I I am amazed at times and sometimes the, the conversations about serving, how they go. Yes, it is possible that any one of us gets out of balance And we are are neglecting our families and our devotions with the Lord. And all we're doing are serving 
in our church family. That can happen. That's wrong. Can I get a witness? But for most people, that's generally not the case. Sometimes it can be. But we, we have at times, across generations, you, you, pastors hear this, well, you know, I, I, I really, I know we need to serve and I, I know it's important, but um, I, that, that's really not for me. I, 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 need to, I need to focus on me. Let me ask you a question about your pastors. What if your pastors stepped up here this morning and said, hey, I love y'all, we love y'all, but we can't serve in this next season. We just need to focus on us. How are y'all gonna think about us? Uh Uh-huh, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. I heard a great illustration. This true story, church is moving and they, they are, are going from the campus that they were in, they've built a new campus and they're in the process of packing everything up and moving to where they're going. They had grown and a person in the church is, is talking with one of the deacon's wives one day and said, you know, I, I really don't want to, to do this move. I like my church the way it is. I don't want to be a part of this. I just don't think it's going to feel like church for me. Listen to what this wise deacon's wife said. I tell you what, if you'll come help us pack a few boxes and unpack a few boxes and put some of those new cribs together, I promise you it's going to feel like home. It's not even about doing those activities. It is about doing them with one another. It is about persevering to the finish line. It is about not quitting. It is about not giving up. Imagine if Jesus is in the desert and on the 39th day he cries out to the Father, I can't do this anymore. I'm going home. Imagine if Noah and his family had built the ark and the only thing that remained was the door of the ark and Noah had thrown his hands up and said, God, I'm tired. I've waited 120 years. This seems like foolishness. Nobody likes me anymore. They think I'm a nut. I'm done. And he never built the door. Imagine. Imagine if Mary had been like the more than 600 thousand last year who said this baby is inconvenient and she hadn't persevered to the finish line imagine if Jesus had gotten right to Golgotha and they're about to drive the first nail and he's like oh no uh uh-uh Gabriel Michael Imagine what it would be like if he never, ever said those words. It is finished. For all of us, there are different seasons and different stations in life and life changes. But there is no retirement of being a follower of Jesus and a part of church family and serving one another. There's not, can I get a witness? There's not. Calvin Coolidge, the 30th president of the United States, at his memorial, at his, after his death, a statement was shared that he had shared, and this is what he said. I don't agree with it 100%, but I love the thought. Nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. Talent will not Nothing is more common than unsuccessful people with talent. Genius will not. Unrewarded genius is almost a proverb. Education will not. The world is full of educated derelicts. I would say idiots too. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. I can't agree with that. But he's right that persistence and determination are profound Important characteristics. 
The slogan, press on, has solved and always will solve the problems of the human race. No, it won't unless you are Jesus Christ. Or those who walk in him. And what the Apostle Paul says to the, to the elders of this church in Ephesus that is in a pagan community that is nothing like heaven. He is telling them, press on. He's giving them that example of persist to the finish line. He says, if only I may finish my course and ministry that I received from the Lord. So pastors, press on. Press on. When you feel that you didn't do your best, Confess it to the Lord and press on. When things are difficult and challenging, press on. When someone hasn't thanked you for something you did, press on knowing you didn't do it for them anyway. Press on. And church family, expect your pastors to press on. Expect your pastors, even when their knees wobble, to not quit the fight, to not abandon the faith. The Apostle Paul then gives two final ones. One is warn against false teachers and false teachings. He says this in verse 28 to 31 of chapter 20. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. This is crystal clear. There are wolves on the outside that will seek to destroy the church family and there are wolves that will arise within the church family. It should not surprise you one bit. In fact, you should expect your pastors who are given like shepherds rod and staff not to lord over the sheep, not to beat the sheep, but to guard and protect the sheep that at times they would step in and say, hey, this teaching that we're hearing is not of the word and let us explain why. And you ought to stand with them, whether that's coming from outside or coming from inside. For those who would ever seek to be, to be agents of disunity and division and diversiveness in the body, you should expect the pastors and the deacons should stand with them, that they would be ministers and ambassadors of peace in the body of Christ. Does that, a mean, does that mean we agree on everything eye to eye? Of course it doesn't. It does not. But even in our disagreement, it ought to be peaceably. And it ought to reflect a Christ-like spirit. Today, we have not only theological and biblical teachings and social teachings and and, and pervasive teachings on how you raise children and how you don't raise children. And, and I, 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 even just a couple days ago, a published article about how it would be, in, in a prominent publication in the United States, how it would be wrong to hinder a child, even a very young child, from exploring and pursuing gender transitioning medical treatments. Dear friends, we have to speak wisely and righteously in love and according to the word of God. We must be ones who are willing to speak truth and love, but that truth and love is not simply constrained to moral issues or even to theological issues. We are headed into what is no questionably going to be maybe more than we have ever seen, one of the most divisive election cycles that the United States has ever known. We've already endured some. This one is shaping up in ways that it seems like it will be greater than any. I just want you to know, if their name is not Jesus, they are not my king. I don't care if they have a D, R, or an I, or anything else behind their names. And you and I have to be extraordinarily wise. This idea that you can only support one party or only support one, that, wait, show, yeah, that's, well, let me back up. I almost, I, almost, I almost had to confess I was wrong. There is only one party. It is the Jesus party. 
It is not the R party and it is not the D party. Let me just give you a practical explanation of how ridiculous this is. Our, our current CEO of the county, he term limits out. He's been a great CEO. He term limits out this year. There are candidates running for his role. I'm not about to endorse one of them. I've talked to several of them. I have known, I've known two of them a very long time. There is no Republican candidate running against them. So practically, here's what that means. The Democratic and Republican primaries on May the 21st, it doesn't matter what your previous declarations are. You have to go in and declare, are you Democrat or Republican? That's the way Georgia operates. If you declare Democrat and you go in in that, uh, primary, the, that primary ballot, if you declare Democrat, you're going to get to vote as to which of those three, and there, there's a number of other offices that are being run for, there are county commission officers, offices, and so forth, but you're going to get to vote, particularly for the CEO offices, office, you'll get to vote as to which of those candidates. If you declare independent, or if you declare Republican, you don't even see them, because it's a primary. But because it there is no opposition outside of the Democratic Party among those three. Whoever wins that primary will be our next CEO. And for some of us, we live in the city of Tucker. Our church is situated in the city of Tucker, but we are in the county of DeKalb. Call the police department. Who do you get if you're in the city of Tucker? You get DeKalb County's finest, and they are extraordinary men and women. Call EMS. Who are you going to get? You're going to get DeKalb County's EMS. Call the fire service. You're going to get DeKalb County fire services. Our next CEO has an extraordinarily important role along with our county commissioners and superior court judges and so forth. And this idea that, well, look, if I ever vote anything other than Democrat, I, I'm not a Christian. If I vote anything other than Republican, I'm not a Christian. That is ludicrous. When you step into that voting booth, you ought to have one t-shirt on and it ought to be your Jesus t-shirt. And not one of those candidates is Jesus, right? So you should pick the very best you can with the best conscience before the Lord. The last thing that he says is pass the mantle and I will close this. He talks about passing the mantle in verses 32 to 35. And he says, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I coveted no one's silver or gold apparel. You yourselves know that these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The apostle Paul, right off, he is commending this ministry to the next generation of leaders in Ephesus as these elders and pastors have gone there. Every pastor of Rehoboth should be thinking and continually doing their ministry well, but they should always be looking to multiply to new leaders, always. And all of us should know that there is a day coming, there is a time coming when in the Lord's providence, some way, somehow, he will put us in a different role. And in the Lord's timing, that is a good thing. And we ought to be doing that. We ought to, every generation ought to be passing the mantle to the next generation. We ought to be raising up warriors and ambassadors of peace for Jesus Christ. We ought to be investing in their lives and we ought to be passing that mantle to generation after generation. And here's how Paul does it. It's amazing. He doesn't say, hey, I'm just going to sit on the sideline. I've done my role. Y'all take it now. That's not at all what he says. He says, we have worked with our own hands. And what does he call that work? Hard work. Ministry is hard work. 
And we ought to do that hard work until the very last day that we can. And as we're doing it, we are handling that, handing that mantle and we are continuing to work hard for the kingdom of God. We are not building a Troy empire here or a Pastor Bobby empire here or Pastor JD empire here. Our names are not even on the sign out front. Did you notice that? Do you know why? I mean, yes, we've spent a lot of money on my PhD and my master's degree, a lot of money. I have so many books, I can't even put them all in my full office here at the church. We could probably buy a nice little cabin if we were to sell those things. Because you know what's most important about our role here? You. You. The church family, you are, because God has called us to be shepherds of this church family, and that shepherding is always with an eye of raising up new leaders in all aspects of ministry. It's not a matter of me saying, well, I've always done this. I should always be doing this, preparing others to do this, right? Because the reality is it wasn't mine to begin with. It's ours as we do it with him. It's an incredible farewell message to remember. It's an extraordinary passage. It's one that I commend to our pastors. And brothers, I am so honored to serve with you. It is one of the greatest joys of my life to know your integrity, to know your faithfulness. This past week, we had a a funeral in our church family on Thursday, and I could not do that funeral. I called Pastor Bobby, and I said, hey, Pastor Bobby, and they're they're taking care of their son, Roy, um, who, as many of you know, had a stroke uh, recently. He's beginning to show some new signs of improvement, and we're delighted with that. They've got a lot going on with that. And I called Pastor Bobby, and I said, hey, Pastor Bobby, I can't do this funeral. Could you do it? Do you know what his response was? Yes, let me double check my schedule. That, that's the kind of men you have serving you. That, that's the kind of men who should be serving you as pastors. And to our pastors, I say this. The Lord has blessed me to be a part of a number of church families over my life. This is one of the greatest church families I've ever been a part of. They're extraordinary. Their love and respect for their pastors, their honoring of their pastors, and their willingness to work with and to follow the leadership of the pastor, it's extraordinary. And we shepherd that relationship carefully before the Lord for it is not first and foremost for our benefit. It is for the kingdom of God. And it is one of the most beautiful things that I've ever experienced in my life. If you're looking for a great church family, you won't find a perfect one in Roboth, but you'll find a great one here. Come talk to us at the end of the service. If you are looking to want to turn and follow Jesus, then I encourage you to do that today. Come and talk to us. Father, thank you for giving us an example in this farewell address. Thank you for teaching us afresh of the incredible role you have given pastor elder overseers. And may we, the pastors of this church family, be faithful to live those out. May this church family be faithful to remember these teachings of the word of God, that they would both expect and honor these things in their pastors. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Yeah.
cross of Jesus Christ, as you leave today, remember our one thing to invite others to follow Jesus with us. Pray over your one, pray over your 10, follow Jesus faithfully this week. Have a great week.